Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to talk about the burden of proof, but not about the burden of proof itself, because I've said, so far as I can tell, pretty much everything there is to say about that. It's rather about the people who invoke the burden of proof. And uh, bear in mind, everything I'm about to say is statistical, not logical. So it's a most of the time, almost all of the time sort of thing, not that there won't be exceptions. So, that out of the way. No one actually believes in the burden of proof. This is something that I have come to conclude, having seen this over, oh, frankly, the course of years, that uh, no one who talks about the burden of proof actually means it. Um, nobody, that is to say, nobody thinks of this as an actual principle. They propound it as if it's a principle. They state it like it's some sort of principle, but it's not. It's basically just a rhetorical trick. It's, um, it's remarkably analogous to like a squid shooting out ink before running away. Its purpose is only to cloud the waters. It does not actually express anything which the speaker holds to be true. Now, you can tell this pretty straightforwardly by simply seeing how they react if you yourself invoke the principle that they just supposedly stated. So, um, you know, one of the easiest examples of this is to point out, well, you know, it would be a waste of time for me to talk to you if you're not capable of rational thought. Now, the default position is for me to not believe in the existence of things, so the default position is for me to not believe that you're capable of rational thought. And so if you have any evidence to show that you are in fact capable of rational thought and therefore that talking with you has some purpose, please present it. Now, they never ever react to this with, hey, you're learning, you're catching on. Never, not once. I've never seen that. In all the time, and there are variants on this, uh, you know, I lack a belief that you're honest. Do you have any evidence to show that you are in fact honest? Because it'd be a waste of time to talk with a dishonest person. Again, they're supposed to, in theory, say like, hey, you're right. You're not supposed to just take this on faith. You're supposed to ask for evidence of these things before believing in them. And so it's my job now to give you evidence. And I'm used to this because this is the way I expect things to go. So here's my evidence. There are some catch-22s in that, because if you're supposed to act as if the thing is not true, then, you know, you're supposed to ignore them because you're presuming them to be irrational until such time as you actually get the evidence, but they're not the ones who can present it since you're ignoring them. Um, that'd be if you're really following their principles well. But um, even if you're not, just the burden of proof, just that one, you're not, you're not following through on the principles of, you know, act like something's not true until it's been proven to you. Okay. They still don't do it. They don't act like it's true. They don't react as if you have at least partially learned this principle. Now, um, to show you by contrast, my friend Eve Kinnainen, she's very uh, fond of the principle of retortion. That's um, for any given rule, apply that rule to itself and see if it holds up under itself. If it doesn't, you can ignore this because if it's true, it must be false. And so it's obviously not true. So, um... You know, a, a, uh, um, a, a good example is all generalizations are false. Well, in that case, if you apply it to itself, it being a generalization, it's false, which means it's not true that all, gener all generalizations are false. That's the principle of retortion in action. Very useful philosophical sort of just first test before you start actually considering something in any sort of detail. Apply it to itself and see, does this thing even stand up to itself? Because if it doesn't, well, you're done. Um... So, if somebody goes and applies the principle of retortion, say, to itself, well, it does hold up under itself, that you should check things. Yeah, you should. There's no problem that you should check this itself, and it is a good test when you look into it, so you're good. Now, if somebody does this, if somebody says, like, well, apply the principle of retortion to retortion, and it stands up, she, she wouldn't get offended, she wouldn't say, how dare you consider doing this? She'd say, hey, good job. I think I've seen her do that very thing. It's not, not very common for people to, you know, um, actually try that. But I, I think I may have even seen that once where, you know, when you try to apply a principle that Eve espouses, she'll tell you, good job, well done. I mean, even if you do it wrong, um, I've done this myself. I've got a number of videos that are logic lessons and I've occasionally seen uh, people in the comments put together some sort of syllogism, um, you know, like modus ponens, modus tollens and so on. And, you know, a bunch of the times, well, they were, frankly, um, not very good syllogisms in that, um, that the premises were false. Um, but 
you know, I would tell them, hey, good job putting together a valid syllogism. Not actually sound, you know, your premise is false, but you know, not bad. Um, it's harder when it's not even valid, that's to say when the conclusions don't fall from the premises. Um, but, you know, and, you know, again, you know, no one's perfect. No one lives up to their standards all the time. There may be times when I don't live up to that. But as a rule, I will tend to do that. If somebody puts together a syllogism, you know, after I've explained how to do that, even if they didn't do it well, I will compliment them for trying. I will compliment them for attempting to do the thing which I just said was actually what you're supposed to be doing. No one does that with the burden of proof. I mean, look over. Look over the internet. Find somebody who likes to talk about the burden of proof. It's like, you've got the burden of proof. And find them ever accepting it when they make a positive claim. And the, the whole thing about positive claims, um, this is an aside, but just because it's kind of useful to know. Um, the, the problem with that whole positive claim thing, the one making the positive claim has the burden of proof, is that all positive claims are convertible into negative claims and vice versa. Um, it, it's because a double negative is a positive, so you can always convert a positive into a double negative, and then just sort of group it so, you know, that it, something is the case is also that it's not not the case. Um, it also, uh, generally speaking, works as a simple trick to simply take a negative and call it a positive thing. Um, so you can define honesty as a lack of lying. You can define dishonesty as a lack of telling the truth. Um, you'll find these things that are positive words, where you're not saying not in front of them, that mean the opposite thing. And anytime you have either of them, you can make a, a positive claim about anything. What this comes from is that um, if somebody is going to make a non-localized claim about local phenomenon, it is impossible for a finite creature such as us to verify all locations. Um, so this comes to, um, you know, like the classic, you can't prove that there does not exist a purple swan somewhere in the universe because, well, you would have to do that. You would have to look everywhere in the universe and we're not capable of looking everywhere in the universe. Um, you know, a galaxy that's receded you know, um, past, I forget, oh, I forget the name for that boundary, but it's so far away that space is expanding so fast we can never get to it. Um, the, uh, it, it's outside the visible. Um, there, there's actually, it's slightly different than being outside the visible universe, but it's related. Uh, anyway, like, yeah, something, you know, for all we know, there is a purple swan on some planet we've never seen and can never get to, and we have no way of finding out. So that sort of, um, you know, the claim you can't actually claim that there is no purple swan out there. Um, because again, you can't prove that either. Um, so that sort of negative claim would still require proof. You can't make that. You're kind of limited to stating, I don't know. And it's not practical since it can never affect us. The, um, so that's where that whole positive claim thing comes from. It's actually, if you really get into it nonsense, it has no value of any kind. Um, as a general rhetorical thing, I do advise just going with that whole positive claim thing because it's so popular. And since whatever you want to say can always be phrased, you know, phrased as saying that the other person is making a positive claim, it doing the tiny additional work to showing how their, whatever they just said that you're asking them to prove is a positive claim, it just, it, it makes life simpler on everybody. And then you'll show that it's a positive claim, um, cause it, you know, will be, they're making some actual truth claim. And then... They won't prove it. They won't consider proving it. They'll just be angry at you for not essentially taking it on faith. Um, and, and there are other things too. Um, you know, I gave some of the really, really simple examples that that are, you know, some, somewhat rhetorically effective, um, where the result of saying like, hey, I'm supposed to not take things on faith, right? So do you have evidence that you're an honest person? Um, you know, that always gets met with, oh, wow, that that's so Christian of you. Or, uh, you know, like, so that's how you treat people, huh? And it's like, you claim to have this principle. You don't like when I apply it? Well, you know, consider whether or not it's actually your principle. And it's not their principle. Which is kind of the point. But there are other things, too. Because, um, for example, if anybody engages in any form of counter-argument, they are then obligated to prove their counter-claims. This is partially why you do see a lot of atheists retreat to the pure, like, that's not evidence. That hasn't been... Uh, or, you know, if they really are being consistent, you haven't proven that that's evidence. There's no ev I haven't seen any evidence that doesn't... I haven't seen that that evidence that you just pre presented to me is evidence. 
and they just go through a, p a route of pure negation, in which case they do escape having the burden of proof because they're literally not claiming anything about the world other than their own su subjective experience. Um, this doesn't... They, they have a really hard time keeping this up, though. Because they'll trip up. They'll tell you that you're being irrational. At which point, they're making a truth claim about the world. They're saying, making a claim about the state of the world. At which point, they would have to back it up by their own principles. And they never will. So you can see that, too. Um, anytime they make any form of counter-argument, anytime they give a counter-example, it is then, by their principles, if this actually were their principle, up to them to prove that this is, in fact, a counter-example. That there are not that their counterexample actually does disprove the thing that it is supposed to disprove. Um, but I mean, if you actually point this out to them, like, you know, I've presented evidence for this, you're claiming this is counter evidence, but it has this flaw, you know, prove that it does not have this flaw that renders it useless as counter evidence. And then they'll say, hey, the burden of proof isn't on me, it's on you, you're the one making the claim, utterly ignoring the fact that in fact they just made a claim. Um, so, again, you can see this all over, no matter what, no matter which way you approach this from, you will never get one of these people who talks about the burden of proof to ever treat it like it's an actual principle, that is to say something that will bind them as well as other people. And that pretty much means that when you find somebody who talks about the burden of proof, you can utterly disregard them, because they're not being sincere, they're not being honest, they have never thought this through. Um, it's worth it, you know everyone's got a soul, every soul is valuable, so it's worth it to occasionally point this out just in case maybe somehow this is the exception where they just never, <coughs> pardon, never thought about it. Um, so, you know, never give up on somebody until it's been proven that there's, you know, nothing you can do for them. But that said, um, if you find somebody talking about the burden of proof, the odds that you can do anything for them are astonishingly small because they're not thinking. They're just sort of spewing rhetoric in, attempt to in an attempt to cloud the waters. Um, probably, frankly, in a monkey-see-monkey-do sort of way. That they That is to say, um, you know, the same way monkeys learn tool use just by watching another monkey. Um, you know, and people learn skills by watching other people, too. Um, it's not unique to monkeys. But, um, but the thing is, you know, in monkeys it's sort of simpler and clearer, and, you know, hence using that. That in monkey see, monkey do, it's not that the monkey has, like, an abstract concept of what's going on. He has no plan. He imitates behaviors that he sees, and these work. And he does variants on them and, you know, habituates to ones that, that do work. Um, and so you see a lot of that, that, that they'll have seen somebody use the burden of proof, and then they won that debate! Or something to that effect. And, um, and then so they copy it. They try it themselves. They see if it works. And it's, you know, remarkably like the monkey with the stick. You saw another monkey poke the stick into where the termites are and pull it out with some termites and eat them. So maybe that'll work when he tries it. Um, you know, tries different si types of sticks and blades of grass and so on. You know, finds what works and what doesn't. And so I think it's generally that sort of trial and error that you get this sort of rhetorical device. But if you find this, if you find this sort of pure rhetoric with no thought behind it, don't engage it. You're just going to be wasting your time. Um, engaging rhetoric as if it's thought, rational thought, is utterly useless. It produces no effects uh, whatsoever, other than frustration. Um, in theory, maybe it could be useful for somebody else who's watching. Even there, frankly, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, in, in theory, maybe it could, and therefore it's not a waste of time. But at the same time, you can do the exact same thing with a rock. You, you can just rebut the rock's, you know, lack of positions, as well as pure rhetoric with no thought behind it. Um, so, I mean, it varies. It's not, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. It requires wisdom to deal with every particular circumstance. Um, but at the same time, there are plenty of times when you should not give to dogs what is holy and don't throw your pearls before swine lest they turn on you, trample them underfoot and turn on you and rend you limb from limb. So, um, something to consider when, when balancing these things out and finding what's right in every, you know, the, the particular course of actions right in the particular circumstances. And until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.